I think if you're trying to convince your friends or your family to buy property together, this is going to be a very good place to start. I brought on Colin Newberry. We did a video about this topic a while back. Colin, how's it going? It's going well, sir. Yourself? I'm doing really, I'm really well. I'm glad we got a chance to get together again and talk about this topic. Uh, I know there are these legal agreements that exist. So if you want to buy property together, anywhere, anybody in your sphere of influence, because you really want to get started into real estate, or maybe you just need so, so you can put your, your funds together. There are legal ways to make this happen and protect, I guess, all the parties concerned, right? Right. And legal agreements, you know, number one rule that I tell everybody when you call up a lawyer is put it in writing and that makes it a legal agreement. You know, you don't have to have all of the academia language that makes it sound confusing. It's about knowing what your obligations are and what your responsibilities are and what your expectations are. And so having that conversation is the legal agreement. And a lot of the times that you will talk with me or send someone to me, it, it's not about what you know, it's about what questions you didn't know. And what is it that you need to talk about up front so that you can figure out what the answer is when everybody's still in the honeymoon phase. Right. So I found this awesome video on TikTok that really illustrates kind of like what we're talking about here. I'm going to play that first and then we're going to go ahead and and speak on it after the video. Here we go. I convinced five of my friends to buy a 24 acre ranch with me. Here's how I approached them about the partnership. I decided I didn't want to get married until I could do it on land that I owned. I found a couple example properties and I ran the numbers. I figured out how much each partner would have to bring and how much work it would take. I approached my friends I wanted involved, they agreed, and we went to look at properties. We picked the one that needed the most work, but everybody was on board. We closed and we finished the project and we celebrated with a little picnic. We get to enjoy it, but we rented an Airbnb to cover costs. All right, so Colin, I mean, there were like five friends there that wanted to buy land and property together. With these agreements that exist, we can, could we make that work? You can absolutely make it work. There will be friction at some point in that relationship because if you're one of those five friends you not only have the back of house friction of your relationship amongst the four other investors but the front of house friction of your intentions to put it on airbnb and all that comes with that whether it's booking a calendar on prime weekends that you want to enjoy it or dealing with uh one person's need to have more rental income come in to cover their share versus one person's desire to be able to go out on the 4th of July when you can get the most rental income. Mm. And not only in regards to Airbnb, but to four other people. You know, if you've ever had to share share scheduled calendars with, with four other people who have just as busy a life as you do, yeah. it's hard and, and it's it requires communication to make sure that everyone's not feeling taken advantage of or that they're not getting the full advantage of what they they thought when they were getting into the deal mm, right you are i feel it's very dependent on the type of property your your end goal is if it's a buying an investment property with the airbnb or if you're just simply doing it just to combine funds so you can get into your first property it really depends on how uh, you you can i guess really write the terms of these types of agreements to make sure that, you know, Hey, all parties are, are happy. And, th and that's part of like the value that you bring is that since you specialize in these agreements, like you come up with a lot of these scenarios that way, you know, sometimes it's people never even thought of. Yeah. And it, and it changes based on the needs of the people buying it. You know, if you've got, um, if you've got a, a property you're purchasing with a romantic partner, that's a very different situation than, a joint ownership property where you and your best friend are both just buying your first starter house together because, um, you know, both of those have the ability to make homestead claims on, which are going to be greater than any sort of entity you can provide, give tax breaks, mm -hmm. um, and do a lot more uh, benefit to you because it is your primary residence. When you start moving towards an Airbnb, especially if you're, you know, specific to the video we mentioned, you know, it appeared to be that there's a Airbnb with water and, you know, you're probably running a greater risk of incidents then to where you're going to be needing to drop that into an LLC in order to shield that liability from from yourself and your partners that you go into business with uh, and owning that property. And that doesn't keep you from using it for personal reasons. But when you don't have that homestead exemption, it's not your primary first home, then it, it uh, changes the dynamic of how you 
come to that final company agreement or that final joint ownership agreement or that marital agreement or the cohabitation agreement, all things that are just going back to what we started off with, trying to put the ground rules in place, both for entry, for maintenance, and for exit. Mm. I love the way you put it the last time we talked about this. You like you called it a prenup for your home, where we're talking about the beginning, middle, and the end of what this kind of journey looks like. If you buy property together, you know, who's going to have the final say and who's bringing what's the table. And then when I heard that, I was like, mm, how nice would this be if more people were aware that, Hey, these are, there are legal agreements exist. You can buy property for your friends and family or anyone in your sphere, uh, and not really risk the relationship so much. And I was like, that's a pretty good solution. If you ask me. Yeah. And I mean, you, you can't ever give a definitive statement like that without a lawyer posting some sort of qualifying statement in there, but you protect risk as much, yeah. you know, um, there's no drama like family drama. And so <laughs> when you get those documents put together, the reason why it's so important at the beginning to do that is that, like I said, it's the honeymoon phase and everyone, um, has this good vibe to be able to have those hard conversations, whether it's financial, whether it's use, whether it's, you know, obligations, but the most important thing is, is knowing what conversations to have. You know, if, if you and I are buying a, a lake house together, well, for you, this might be a stretch. For this, it might be that I want to have somewhere to go. And if I'm going over there every other weekend, well, you're not going to get that Airbnb income. And you're going to have to be ponying up. And eventually, if you are having a busier life than I am because of your whatever you are dealing with on your personal side, kids or travel or work or whatever it may be, you want to have a mechanism to where that resentment doesn't grow, but that resentment can be brought back to, okay, here's what we agreed to. If you go over, you know, X number of days, you need to start paying one half of the market rent into the joint account so that I, you know, I've got something to cover the loss of income that we've got, but we have buffers on, you know, I get first pick. We do a, you know, people, some people have done like drafts, you know, you get 4th of July, I get Memorial Day weekend. Okay. You get the third pick. What do you want? And you can kind of calendar those out so that, you know, not only between ourselves, but also for your online posting, when you can have availability for that, that property. Mm. Mm. So I guess it's all the, the devils in the specifics on how really you want to break it down uh, in that regard. Yeah. And look, it, it, it's, it's the safety net. If you have a good relationship and things are going well and, you know, there's nothing that says that you can't make agreements beyond what's there. It's for when things are not on, you know, a good trajectory or when things have changed that you have that as a backup so that you know what your baseline is. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if, if we have X agreement, but then, you know, turns out that my spring break plans got canceled and there's no one that's renting it out. Well, then sure. Why not go ahead, knock yourself out and take, go up there. It's not no loss, no harm, no foul. Um, but at the same time, you know, if, if you're starting to get to that point to where there's conflict and friction, that's where you want to make sure that you've addressed how those conflict and friction conversations have already been resolved. Ideally people find a way though. I'm glad you kind of mentioned that kind of conflict part. Cause I think that's a big pro in my eyes. If you have like a third party, neutral party, that is bringing up scenarios that are maybe a little bit more or less uncomfortable to talk about because it's like you know who's going to make these decision and you know it's it's you know we're kind of we are talking about real estate and a lot of money here that's the beauty of hiring a real estate attorney who specializes in agreements because they're that's that's the purpose you're serving so that make so you uh are limiting your risk correct correct you're limiting it and and you're defining it is mm -hmm. really i think the most important thing and and that goes for, you know, things as small as, well, if I'm going out there, I'm not going to pay the Airbnb cleaning company because I can clean it ourselves. Well, in years of my die, you might be like, no, we need to have this business run to where it's properly cleaned for the next guest. Um, and, and those things are small and those things probably aren't going to be detailed out in the agreement. But, you know, like you were saying, it's about what you you've had the conversation about. Um, and so make no bones about it. This is a business relationship, no matter how much they're your friends. And it's most likely a six figure business relationship. 
And if you're going to sign on the dotted line for that mortgage with somebody else, then you need to have another dotted line that says that how you and that someone else are going to operate that business. Mm. Well said. I got one more video that I want to play that kind of is talking about or along the same lines as this topic, but maybe just presenting in a different way so we can see a different scenario. I own six properties and have bought every single one by partnering with friends. That means I do not own 100% of the property. In one property, I'm only a 13% owner and another I'm a 33% owner. Without partnering, there's no way I would be able to own a house to live in, let alone own a beach house and a lake house. It's also such a relief to be able to split up the responsibility, liability, and money. With all of these properties, any income we make when we're not using the space goes into a joint bank account that we do not touch. This is in case of emergencies or if we need to buy things for the house. Many of your first instincts may be to say, well, I can't can't do this because insert any excuse it's totally normal there's so much fear that is associated with finances and real estate and for good reason i have lots of free information around this if you're interested let me know what you think so i just love this creator because we're talking about something very similar you know these kind of agreements to buy you know co-ownership property together so i think we have like our message is like along the same lines uh, but what do you think about that one, Colin? Did that one uh, did that one give you any, any any ideas or anything to add to? Yeah, I mean the 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 initial takeaway on that one is, you know, the sharing of liability. Um, you know, you, you're talking to a lawyer, so you know that I'm going to be championing having some sort of entity that that limits that liability. Hence yeah. the name, limited liability company. Um, you know, that can cause problems with financing or or post financing transitioning it in there. Um, mostly when certain owners are not on the note and not gone through the financing process, banks don't tend to, to like that um, because they assume that if somebody owns part of the LLC that went through the financing for the property, it can give them red flags. On the other hand, most banks don't care if, if you and I and two other buddies all go through underwriting together and then transfer it to an LLC that we're all four on the deed of trust for the note and we're the only four members of the entity. That one, as long as you're paying rent, they generally don't care, don't care to know. Um, the thing that I would say is the second issue spotting for that video is, you know, I once was told that depending on how the company agreement or your agreement, whether it's not an LLC or just a, a agreement between owners is, you need to make sure it's written correctly because if it's majority rules, 49% is the same as no percent because they can make all the rules and make all the decisions. So when I hear 13%, that always kind of raises my ears as to what does that minority owner have as far as voting rights and, and just generalized rights within the company. Um, and I keep saying company because I think that for these situations, I don't see a, a manner in which you can have this many owners that are being shown in the videos without having it be some sort of entity. You can do it as a joint ownership agreement, which is the same thing, but it doesn't have the limitations on liability. What I mean by that is if something bad happens, the asset, the house is, is exposed, but not, you know, the 10 other things that might be a part of uh, your own estate that if you put it in your personal name. And so having that Put together i think is important when i do a company agreement you know i always have a separate distinction for what i call our fundamental business transactions selling taking on debt disposing of interests wrapping it up refinancing those are generalized to have if not a hundred percent you know to where the vast the super majority at the minimum to where you have minority rights that somebody's not going to be able to to be the tail wagging the whole dog Mm. Gotcha. So it sounds like you do have your own is I don't want is it a checklist that you have that kind of kind of uh as you're going through these kind of operators agreements with folks or is that how's your process look like? Yeah. So I mean I have a checklist but it, as to what I was just talking about you kind of have two buckets. You have the mm -hmm. the general operational bucket and and you're never going to have a um a play by play on that. Well, that video, I think, did a very good job and showed how you plan this correctly by saying, you know, for every dollar that we make, it goes into the, the joint account that everyone has access to. And that's where the, the obligations come out of. And we just keep that as our rainy day fund for, if you know, things go sideways, new, new roof, their you know, bachelor party tears the place up or whatever it may be. Mm. Um, my, my conversation was more along the lines of, you know, if you want 
to have certain rights, you can't have it be a majority vote if there's six people, because it doesn't take the same amount of decision making rights for smaller decisions as it does for major decisions. The flip side of that is if it's a two person joint venture, then I've laughed with everybody. Well, maybe laugh's not the right term, but I, I, there's not a good way to get around 50 50. 50 50 is either you're in business together or you're not. And if you can't figure it out, there's not an company agreement that's going to, you know, address minor issue one, but allows you to have major asset two continue to stay in existence. You're either going to get along or you're not. Mm. Mm, well said. So I really wanted to kind of take a dive deeper into some of these comments because I feel like that's where some of these golden nuggets really are with folks uh, from these videos that we just watched. Let's see here now. This is, the, yeah, this is at the very top. Uh, let's see. McKenna says that neither the realtor nor the lender were any help. And we ended up with everything in one person's name. Now, <laughs> that sounds like that could have been preventable if, 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 you know, these, this concept existed and there was a, a realtor with a real estate attorney that had an idea. What do you think, Colin? Yeah. I mean, what that sounds like is that they had a lot of people that needed to get a loan and ran into pushback from the bank about going through the underwriting process for a seven person ranch house that they wanted to buy together. And, you know, when you do that, you know, I'll, there's a huge difference between what the law allows and versus what a lender will agree to. And the law says that you can have 20 different people on a piece of property, but a lender might not go through doing the financial analysis for 20 different people um, because it's just not what their, their process allows for. And, you know, most lenders are also not wanting to have that sort of intricacy for, for, you know, I don't want to say small deals, but for a single asset, single residence deals. In other words, if you're trying to get a residential loan, vacation, second home loan, that is not going to be as um, dynamic of a lending process as if you were doing commercial loans for uh, through commercial lenders, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the reason why people do that is you can get a 30 year loan, you can get it 20% down instead of you know, a 20% loan at 20 years, which is going to change what your obligations are financially. Hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's scroll down a little bit here. Is it? Yes. Okay. Can you read that one by Maria? Yep. Just as safe as buying with a romantic partner, which can be pretty risky. hundred percent. Here's the, the, the fun little nugget on that one is even if you have everything buttoned up, as well as you think you might have it buttoned up. You know, if, if you and I both have a property with, you know, Corey and Crystal that are married um, and they go through a divorce, well, then what happens to their interest and how do we deal with that? Um, and usually it would be addressed in the decree because it's a, a personal property. An LLC interest is not real estate, it's personal property, but you have a percentage interest in this but that can cause all sorts of issues um, because you know now you've got drama within drama that's causing more drama and so um, you have those uh, things in your orbit that also are real fun conversations to have with a whole bunch of people that want to go have a hipster picnic in the grass in front of their new house but at the same time it you know, the sad thing is is that Money solves most problems, at least in these situations. And so having, whether it's that piggy bank that's got money saved up, and I would highly recommend funding that with some seed funding for each owner to have just some cushion there. Mm -hmm. um, but that dovetails into, you know, what I've, I told you in preparation of this phone call, which is sure the bank wants everyone to be on the loan, but if people want out, whether through divorce or just exit strategy in general, how do they get out? And how do they get off that note? Because anyone who bought a house three years ago knows that refinancing it now is a dramatically different uh, environment than what they have for their current mortgage. Absolutely. Absolutely. Having the right people in place to kind of help guide you to make the, I guess, the best decisions possible is like a big key factor to not just in these agreements, but uh, I guess all aspects. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, the, I realize that I'm kind of being negative Nancy here, but 
you know, there's also all the benefits. There's depreciation of real estate. There's tax write-offs. There's the appreciation. And then your profit comes as a capital gains taxation instead of at, you know, income level taxation. And so there are a lot of benefits to this. It's just that you don't get benefits without risk and exposure. And so by addressing the risk and exposure, you better prepare yourself for those benefits, which as the comment section show, there is risk, there is exposure. Yes. Let's, let's, let's read on this one with Christina. Can you see that one? Yes. My friends did this and ended up in a three year local legal battle. I hope that's something you prepare folks for. Right. So what this kind of alludes to is the right to partition property. This is a right that the law allows by statute in Texas that says that if you own property, you are not forever bound to be an owner of that property. You have the right to get your equity out. And if you can't come to an agreement for both valuation and exit, you can file a lawsuit in order to have a court appoint a board to appoint a realtor to get a value to force a sale that the judge will sign as the seller for because you couldn't get it done. Now, generally, you know, three year battle means that uh, usually the lawyer fees will milk everybody from that fire to, to want to keep going forward. And generally speaking, if you have to get some neutral third party valuation done, you know, you get to a point to where you can have um, a buyout done if somebody really wants to stay and has the means to going back to money solves all problems. Mm. You know, if you've got the ability to assume somebody off of the note, which no bank is required to do, but an assumption just to make sure I'm, I'm clear is where Omar and Colin are on a note together. Omar wants his money out. Luckily I have the $60,000 in equity that is his half of the, of the property and I can pay him off but he needs to buy a new house and he doesn't want to have his debt to income messed up by being on the, on the note. And so an assumption says, okay, Colin, we're going to go through this process again. We're going to review your financials to make sure you can independently support this note and you can assume his liability and release him from the mortgage and the deed of trust. And that's what you would want in that situation. And it's great because you get paid out and you don't have the liability. If you don't have the ability to pay someone out, if you don't have the ability to have a bank assume the mortgage, then you're going to have to either refinance or sell because otherwise you might end up in a three-year battle trying to get a partition of that property done. Honey had said that we tried this, but it fell apart quickly. Wish we had some guidance. Yeah. And, and you know, that's just going back to what we've already talked about. It's, I try and operate under a keep it simple, stupid approach. You know, what is it? The expectations, what's the liability, what's your recourse. Um, and so having that guidance, you know, it, it's not what your realtor is supposed to do. It's not what your bank is supposed to do. They're there to make sure that you buy the property. They aren't there to make sure that you've bought it correctly or that you operate it correctly. And so um, like with everything, you see this pot of gold of owning property, which was maybe out of reach if you didn't have the ability to partner with people but you're partnering with people and, and it can be in a very tangible, real way. And, and you need to be able to have a, a, a objective a view of that relationship with that person to the extent that you can have an objective conversation with that person. You know, what happens when, you know, we have a falling out, you know, who gets first dibs. Um, and that's, that's any real estate, whether it's marriage, whether it's a romantic partner, whether it's, you know, I think the comment after that one was saying, my roommates and I want to do this to buy a house. Well, that's, you know, joint ownership. You know, mm-hmm. as I was talking about with, with homestead provisions, there's a very different um, angle that's taken when you're going to be in the primary residence. And I've done joint ownership agreements to where somebody had a joint owner for half of it. And, and in that regard, you figure out, you know, if you're living there, you're paying for, uh, you're, let me put it this way, if you own 50% of the house, you're obligated to make one half of the mortgage payments. But if you have somebody that's living in a three bedroom house with two roommates, well, then you should know what that money coming in is and how that's going to be delineated both between the total mortgage payment and your share of that mortgage payment, because you're not going to be needing to pay all that. On the flip side, if you're the person that's living in that house, you can contract out of partition lawsuits. 
you can contract out of the right to occupy. Both of those are inherent rights to owning real estate. It's called lockup periods. You know, we agree that for the next five years, three years until I can get my income statement, you know, I need three years. I start a new job. Okay. Well, for three years, you can't sue to get a partition time. You're stuck with me unless I default, unless I breach. If I'm not making payments, well, that's a whole different story because I'm the bad guy. But if it's just preference, then you can make parameters and guidelines to have that not be an issue. Gotcha. I had a question for you because when I've talked about this subject with people, sometimes I've ran into the issue of like, well, if I've already bombed property with my significant other or who, who have you, can is this types of agreement still possible? Absolutely. Yes. Um, you can contract for this at any time. You know, uh, for a cohabitation agreement, which is the preferred vehicle for romantic unmarried partners, um, the things that you really want to detail on that is is what you put into it so that you know what you got out of it. You know, I can't tell you how many arguments I see of people that say, well, I put $100,000 and they put $20,000 into the down payment of this house. But that that difference was, you know, that $40,000 difference was a gift to me. I'm still a 50% owner. And so when we sell it, because we broke up, I should get 50% of that down payment back. And I don't think that that may not have been the expectation when you went into it. Now, you can go a lot further down that rabbit hole and say, okay, I'm a four-fifths four owner of this property. And so I'm responsible for four-fifths of the mortgage and property taxes and insurance. Um, I, most people that are in romantic relationships, they don't want to go that far. They understand they're buying it together. And it's not about making this a profitable business venture because that pro rata breakdown makes sense in a business venture. But if you're in that romantic relationship, you know, most people are like, look, 50, 50 on all of the growth. That's fine. As long as I get what I put in out. Um, and then there's, like I always say, there's other things in orbit. The most important one just from personal experience on doing a few partition lawsuits is you, you have an agreement that if you, there's a payment made for the mortgage, that that's for both people, even if it's from one person's bank account, because it, invariably someone starts taking on groceries or car payments or vacations and you start horse trading. I'll do this payment if you do the house payment. And then you get into this debacle of, trying to do an accounting of your life together to see what you can offset against missed payments on your half for groceries and things. And it's, you know, that repairs all of those things that, you know, you, you try and address what you can, but you can never address everything because people find a way. Mm. But if you can get 80%, 90% of it, at least you've got those, those ground rules in place. And I have heard it mentioned before that, you know, these kinds, these types of agreements can be like a living document. So if a change wants to occur, that's something as easy as contacting you and then making an amendment. Is that how that would yeah, work? Absolutely. Um, and it, it's not, you know, we write it to, to last for all time, but it's meant to be malleable with the changes that go on in your life. And so having that fluidity, both via calling me or just doing it with rule number one of being an attorney, put it in writing, that's fine. Hey, I, I really wanted a hot tub. You didn't have the money for the hot tub. I'm going to put a $5,000 hot tub in here. And we agree that, you know, I get the $5,000 added on to my tab for when we sell the house or whatever it may be. You know, those things are perfectly fine. And it's all about passing the fingertip test. This is, here's where I said this, here's where you said this back when we were on good terms and, and not when you were mad at me. Mm, gotcha. So let me ask you, someone who's watching this, probably a little bit more interested and in talking about their specific scenario, like what would the next step be like to like get some face-to-face -face time with you, Colin, or how's your process to get in touch with you and look like? Yeah, email is always best. Um, my email address, you know, if it's on the website, it's you know, Colin at RealtyLawTexas.com. Texas is spelled out. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that it doesn't do much good unless you're down the road a little bit, meaning calling me up to talk about potential ideas is not worth the money that you're going to pay me. It makes more sense when you have something that you're either putting an offer on, 
got some sort of contractual approval or that you're wanting to put an offer on um, because then you have a better idea of what everyone's going to be bringing to the table and who's going to be at that table. Um, but if it's just, you know, if I want to do this with my friends, what do I need to do? Well, first off, you need to find your friends, you need to find the property. But um, the major breakdown is going to be, you know, the two videos we watched were, you know, kind of group efforts. Uh, and that one, you know, financing is going to dictate a lot of that. You know, having the bank where you stand with the bank is going to be determinative of a lot of the decisions. If it's just a romantic relationship, you know, knowing what your down payment amount is going to be and what your expectations for that property is, it's it's not magic. It's just a snapshot of things during the good times so that it survives into the bad. And having that, uh, you have to know what's going to be in that snapshot. And so until you have an idea of that, that's usually when it's good to reach out to a lawyer. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, I feel like that's part of like what the value that we bring is ever since I learned about this concept and been gotten f- more familiarized myself with it and just handling multiple parties and multiple uh, you know folks because it, it is typically more than your standard like couple. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts and really getting everybody on a good page to you know move that dial a little bit closer to the finish line is ultimately what we're trying to do here. And Colin, I really appreciate taking the time out. Again, this is a topic that. Uh, I personally like this solution to this problem I'm seeing in the marketplace when it comes to affordability and just so many millennials kind of moving back home. And, you know, how does that, how how is there a possible way out or solution to that if you maybe can partner up with somebody? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, it's rare that it's something that I haven't seen. It's just um, a matter of making sure that we, we all have the knowledge and the facts in front of us to, to be able to ask those questions and put down those answers. Right. And really quickly, either email or something, do you guys, do you do like the virtual kind of like consultations as well? Usually an email is best for me to be able to get some fact gathering and documentation. Lawyers gotcha. really live off of paper, um, PDF, whatever it may be, but also, you know, world's busy right now and it's uh, calling up out of the blue sometimes just to pick a brain is not going to get you the satisfaction you want because I'm going off the fly. Whereas if I get, you know, what I always call the home base, here's the contract, here's the three people that are involved, here's what our basic plan is, then I can schedule something to be able to concentrate on it and give you the attention that you deserve, but also get the information that I need to give you advice that's worth worth listening to. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, I'll have that linked in the description, uh, email and a quick point of contact reference. So Colin, I do appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks, Omar.